Hello, welcome to another edition of DC EKG, a part of the Big Wig Media Podcast Network and distributed by our partner Evergreen. I'm Joe Grogan here as usual with Eric Euland. Today we're joined by a great friend and a special guest, Tevi Troy. Tevi always has interesting insights and he's widely considered an insider's insider. Before we get into Dr. Troy's background and hear from him, I just want to point out that our good friend Eric has just been named a visiting fellow at the Heritage Foundation, where I'll be helping the conservative movement organize for the next Republican administration. Uh, Euland, do you want to tell us more about it? I'll save that for another episode, but let's talk about Tevi. <laughs> Tevi's an author, a bona fide healthcare expert, and a former number two at the Department of Health and Human Services. He warned of the vulnerability of the U.S. to coronavirus in 2016 and more recently pointed out flaws that still exist at CDC. He also is an expert on West Wing politics as a best-selling presidential historian. His latest book is Fight House, Rivalries in the White House from Truman to Trump. Joe? So let's start with the current uh, White House. Right now we're in the middle of a transition from, uh, you know, to Zeintz from Ron Klain. Uh, I think one thing that's noticeable about this administration is the lack of leaking that's occurring, the lack of public uh, description of acrimony and fights amongst certainly Biden staff. Now, Vice President Kamala Harris has gotten a lot of hits in her staff and she's had turnover. It seems like it's all been directed in, in that uh at the vice president's office. But do you want to talk a little bit about how you think, uh, looking in, they're able to maintain that discipline that you don't see a lot of fights between the domestic policy advisor or the National Economic Council or the National Security uh, um, Advisor? Yeah, it's a great question, Joe. And first, let me just say that just because you don't see the fights happening doesn't mean they're not happening. But there are a number of reasons why we're hearing less about fights in the Biden administration than we did in the Trump administration and indeed about other administrations. First of all, I just think the media is less interested. They're not pursuing these stories about fights to the same degree they were with the Trump crew, which to them was alien characters, whereas the Biden administration are their friends. So that, I mean, that, that is part of it. Second is Joe Biden does not like what he calls process stories. He hates stories showing up in the press about people fighting and grumbling with each other. And he's made that clear to his staff. And as a result, they tried to tamp it down. If you're known as someone who's leaking stories about infighting, you're not going to go well, you're not going to get along well in the Biden White House. And I would say that you, know, you guys know better than I, but that was probably in contrast to the Trump White House, where it didn't necessarily count against you if you were doing that. Sometimes it actually helped. Sometimes it did. A third thing is that Biden, for the most part, has staff that's been there for a very, very long time, staff that knows him, they've been together. So it's a more cohesive team that has worked together. So I think those three factors, the media less interested, the fact that Biden really doesn't like that kind of stuff, and the fact that Biden has a more cohesive team that's been together a long time really helps shape this narrative that there's less infighting. But it doesn't mean there's none. I know, for example, in, addi in, in addition to what you were talking about with Vice President Harris and her staff, and they've certainly gotten some bad press, and I think some of it is deserved. But early on, when Neera Tandon was nominated to be head of OMB, and she brilliantly put out tweets criticizing senators by name, <laughs> and suddenly those senators said, well, maybe I don't want to confirm you, so she was relegated to another position. She's now the, the staff secretary, but from which she tweets a lot, by the way. Let me just Indeed add that. She does. Which is weird to have yeah. a staff secretary tweeting. But And, and sorry, we'll come back to that, but why it's weird that a cabinet, uh, sorry, staff secretary is actually tweeting. I could talk for a great length about that. But the, <laughs> the fact is that there was a lot of grumbling within the White House, and this did reach the papers that Klain really should have known better than to push the Neera Tandon nomination. And obviously she was the head of Center for American Progress, which you know, is basically a home in waiting for Democrats when they're out of power. And so a lot of people feel like they owed her. So maybe she got more consideration than she should have gotten. And so there, there have been some instances in which there was grumbling also on Afghanistan. Right. Uh, it did leak out that Biden basically ignored 
what the military folks were saying and when they were saying that this was a bad idea to pull out precipitously, as they did. And, and you, criticism of uh, the National Security Advisor and Blinken, I think, the DOD. And, and the interagency, interagency itself. It just hadn't functioned. They weren't prepared. People were caught short. They were on vacation. They had no idea of the size and scope of the panic and the collapse, and they did not handle it very well at all. Right, but a lot of the leaks went back to Biden, which just said Biden didn't want to hear anything other than we are pulling out. He was adamant in his ways, and you know, we all know he's now an 80-year-old guy, and these guys don't necessarily want to hear things different than their worldview. Let's come back to the press for a second, because there's a lot of concern that, to your point, older gentlemen as a White House, at the White House, a lot of people hard left at the White House by popular interpretation, and there's an assumption that the media itself is in some ways by not highlighting or accentuating challenges for people or process in the White House, that they are somehow facilitating a narrative that this presidency is smoother than it otherwise would be, that the public should be more confident in this presidency than it otherwise should be. Have we seen parallels to that in the past? Do we really think that that's an, an accurate charge here? I, I think there was some softness to the coverage of the Obama administration, similarly. Uh, and I think it's a real interesting and stark contrast to previous Democratic administrations, like the Carter administration, which got a lot of deserved negative coverage because there was a lot of stuff going on in the in the Carter years, and the Clinton administration. I mean, you, Eric, you remember pretty well the early Clinton years. I mean, they, they thought that the Clinton administration was going to be a debacle within 30 days, and you had people, Clinton, <laughs> Clinton staff saying, well, we've only been here 30 days, give us a little bit of a break. And, and you know, I think that's a fair pushback. But uh, it did seem to me like the, the press was a little more willing to go after administrations of Republican and Democratic stripes back in those days. Now the press has really signed up with a team more than they have in the past. And is that truly going to be the case going forward? We think that the media picks up sides, decides how to, to tailor and adjust its coverage based on the party in the White House and the predominant issues that uh, a White House is pushing. You know, I don't like straight line extrapolations. So yeah, right now the press is really seems to be on Team D. Well, let's, but I don't know if that's going to continue well, in perpetuity. We'll see. Well, let's add into the straight line again. Take your point exactly on extrapolations, but certainly uh, our four years of the first Trump team, uh, Trump term, seemed as if uh, team media was very much against a Republican conservative administration and looked for every opportunity to find ways to critique either through nominally neutral media coverage and certainly opinion, obviously on cable, on radio, uh, through memes and tweets, everything that we were doing. Here now, again, this is de-escalated. Um, and we saw, you know, during your service uh, in the Bush administration, a pretty aggressive media, pretty easy to jump to conclusions about nefariousness or alleged criminal activity of uh, principles uh, in the White House and in the Bush administration at large that turned out not to be true. So, you know, those who've kind of watched this for a while, and you definitely as an expert have seen this uh, and, and looked at it for a while, well, it's fair to say it's only been two years, but isn't there really a trend headed towards antagonism against conservatives and Republicans in public office here in D.C.? Yeah, well, let's talk about that first Bush administration, or at least the, the first Bush term uh, in the second Bush administration, meaning the Bush 43, Bush, George W. Bush. In the beginning, you had press writing that they were complaining that there weren't enough leaks coming out of the hyper-disciplined Bush operation. I do remember that. And it, you know, I just thought it was a little rich to hear these reporters complaining because you know nobody's feeding them. Uh, so you know, I, I think an administration can potentially overcome some aspects of it. I would certainly argue that the coverage of the Bush administration was more hostile than, let's say, Biden gets. But that said, you can do things within an administration to tamp down some of, of the the targets that the media gets. And how do administrations do that? What are some of the tools to keep that heat down to a minimum? Well, first, let me let me just give a quick plug to my book, Fight House, which speaks in great length about this. And it's, you know, something that I talk to clients or corporate uh, groups and, and do leadership training on these issues, how to tamp it down. But, but basically, there are certain types of disciplines you can impose on the staff that will make it less likely they will fight. You cannot eliminate fighting. This doesn't go away. But you can make it less part of the narrative, and you can make it so that it doesn't necessarily prohibit you from getting your mission accomplished. And is there indeed, based on your experience and Joe, your experience in, in 43's tenure as well as 45, 
there are some positives to internal tension. There are some good policy and political outcomes that can come from friction and tough interactions between principals and a White House inside an administration. This is absolutely true, Eric, and it's a really good point. And you look, let's say, at the Lyndon Johnson administration. They were having trouble with Vietnam, but Johnson did not want to hear alternative viewpoints on it. And in fact, right. there was a collection of aides at the State Department that was worried about this problem, and they thought maybe a different approach on Vietnam was required, but they were so scared of Johnson and seeing what happened to other people who brooked an alternative point of view. Including the vice president, yeah. Hubert Humphrey. They called themselves the non-group, and they right. met secretly so that nobody would know what they were doing. And uh, you know, if nobody knows what you're doing, maybe it doesn't get done, so right. uh, that's an issue too. But yes, I think there is a continuum and along that continuum, you can have chaos on one side. I know everyone's going to say right now, I'm going to point to the Trump administration, but I'm actually going to point, point to the Ford administration, which was one of the most rivalrous and fight-filled administrations I, I've studied. And then on the other hand, you can have something like the Johnson administration, where they just go too far in trying to tamp down any conversations, and they really don't let that creative tension lead to better results. But one thing, and then I want to, I, I want to talk a little bit about... Um, where Biden is in the transition into to dealing with the Republican Congress. But back, um, it served Johnson well to be insulated and not brook dissent in domestic issues like the civil rights push, correct, and legislative push. But it was around the war that it really blew up in his face. Is that, is that simplistic or not? I mean, he was able to achieve a tremendous amount legislatively uh, and... I mean, he was like a machine marching through, getting these things done. But it was where something really complicated uh, with, of life and death consequences that led to disaster when he wasn't able to invite tension and uh, invite arguments into the Oval Office. Do you well, think that's fair or no? It's fair to agree. There's a couple of things going on. First of all, he had overwhelming majorities in the House and Senate as a result of the 1964 landslide election. And that sure went a long way to getting the things he wanted done. And when things are going well, this tension, these kinds of infighting in incidents, they don't emerge, they don't bubble up, and they don't really cripple you. Mm. It's only when things are going badly, as they were in Vietnam, when you start to see these problems come out. The second thing is Johnson was a creature of will and of dominating and imposing his will on others. And he was able to do that with the United States Congress. I don't know if you could do that today, but back then he was able to in sure the 1960s. Mm -hmm. He couldn't impose his will on the North Vietnamese no matter how he tried. Right. And I think that was frustrating to him. But his strength in Congress declined over time as well. Certainly by 66 the time, election was bad right, for the Democrats. 66 election was bad for Democrats, but they still they had a, a fairly predominant majority. But it was those personal relationships with leading Hill Democrats that really frittered away under Johnson's tenure, especially on the domestic policy side, but also as a result of foreign policy, so that friends and deep intimates like Mike Mansfield, for example, or Richard Russell, both of whom had helped him rise to prominence in the Senate and ultimately become vice president, wouldn't take his phone call would not have anything but the most cursory of conversations with him. He couldn't get traction for anything left of his agenda near the end of his tenure. Yeah, absolutely true. His relationships did get worse, but by that point, he had passed much of the Great Society. It's also interesting. He but he still had this ambition, right. this yeah. hope of, of running for re-election. Right, right. right. Until, until the very end. But look, yeah. in, in the 1966 elections, it was a bad election for Democrats, just like the 1978 election in the Carter administration was a bad election for Democrats, but they still retained the majority in both times. And there was really no hope of a Republican majority in both houses, as we all know, until 1994. And so even though Democrats had bad cycles in that period between 54 and 94, they had the House that entire time, and they had the Senate the entire time, except for that brief period from 80 to 86. So let's talk about, the, we, we talked about a transition midterm elections for for Johnson, let's talk about where Biden's sitting right now. Uh, he's lost the House of Representatives. McCarthy's got a, a Speaker of the House with a very small majority. I think Kevin McCarthy was up there yesterday talking about the debt ceiling. And you've got Chuck Schumer running the Senate. Democrats have a two-seat majority. He's got the State of the Un Union coming up. Uh, how do you see, what do you expect for, out of Biden at the State of the Union? And right now, they're, they've got to be in there feverishly working on the State of the Union, correct? Do you think it's fully mm -hmm. baked, or are they still rewriting it? 
Um, and we're coming up on a hard break, so if you could at least give us a prelude, and then we'll come back to this after we take a bit of a time out. So much to talk about there, but let me just say, the hard work in the State of the Union is going on when everybody else is enjoying their Christmas vacation. So, you know, it was really November and December when people are working hardest at State of the Union, and there's lots to talk about the midterm elections and their implications for Biden. All right. Well, thank you for... Uh, for that first segment, we'll be back in a few minutes and talk in a little bit more detail about the State of the Union.